Good morning. Good morning. I'm Reverend Art Allen, retired United Methodist pastor. I'm filling in for uh, Pastor Jenny, who's away uh, this weekend. Uh, good to have you all here. And great to have air conditioning in the sanctuary, right? It's steamy. Yeah. We've been camping for a couple of days, and I spent most of the day yesterday in the camper, to tell you the truth. So. Would you join with me in our call to worship? The Lord be... State Fair being on that we would sing uh, bringing in the sheaves this morning now this song probably needs some explanation for some folks I know that it did when I think I was in I don't know third or fourth grade and a new family moved into uh, Tingley dad was the new banker in town and the family came to the Methodist Church and my dad got up and led we had opening exercises before Sunday school, and my dad would lead a couple of songs, and one of them he did was bring in the sheaves one morning, and we got to Sunday school class, and Craig, who was in my class, said, what's this about bringing cheese? <laughs> uh, well, not a little, uh, there's a difference, okay? So maybe we need a little lesson in sheaves this morning. This song was written by Noel Shaw, 1874, and he was inspired to write it uh, when he was uh, reading from the book of Psalms, from Psalm 126, ver uh, verse 6 especially. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev, which is the desert in the southern part of Israel. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed of sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Okay, sheaves. Well, here's an old uh, image, or an image of how uh, the harvesting of grain, small grain, used to take place, uh, and still does in some places in the world. Civilization really got started when we began to domesticate not only animals, but also crops to feed them with, small grain, and so you have to harvest it. And in the early times, so one of the simplest ways is to take a curved sickle and go out and, and cut it, and then you bundle some of it up in your arm, and that's a sheaves word, okay? Sheave is a Middle English word that really we would say bundle. And in the Old Testament, an omer of grain sometimes was a payment that you could give to someone for a day's labor, and an omer of uh, small grain is the amount of grain you would get from a sheave, a bundle. It would feed you, well, I don't know, maybe it'd be a pound of grain uh, that you could feed, you could eat off for a while. Now, I don't, I've never cut wheat or oats. You know, the state fair, I said we're doing this in the honor of the state fair. The state fair is scheduled after oat harvest, before school starts. Now, that's not probably in most people's minds, even who go to the state fair today, because not many people raise oats anymore. But uh, 100 years ago, um, even, I'm not 100, but I'm 75, and when I was little, my dad still, far he had a tractor, but he also loved still farming with horses. And so uh, horses need oats. So everybody had uh, some, some, an oat field where you could start the new hay to feed to the horses and to the hogs. So this is how I, my first remembrance of harvesting oats in the heat, sometimes like the last couple of days. We had an old binder. I don't know whether dad brought it from southern Missouri or whether it was on the farm when they moved up here. And it, well, this end of it is where the binding is done, where a string is wrapped around the bundle, the sheave. This is what the other end of the machine looks like. 
It has a sickle on it. And then that paddle wheel, so that when the grain is cut, the paddle wheel makes the grain drop onto the canvas, and it goes up and over the top, and then it's tied, like in that one, and dropped on the ground. And Dad's old binder didn't always tie well. <laughs> that part of it was pretty worn, and so I remember it probably, I don't know, as soon as I could learn to tie my shoes at age four, maybe, I walked along behind it, and my job was to tie any of them that the binder didn't bind. And so I would ride on the back after I got tired and that dust and everything, and then do my little job if I needed to. Now, you then gather, you, they're dropped, the bundles, the sheaves are dropped on the ground, then you go and you grab three of them, and you stick them so that the grain is sticking up, the butt is down on the ground so that the mice won't eat the grain, and you put three of them together like a tripod, they lean on each other. Then you grab some others and you put stack others around until you've got a shock. Some other parts of the world, there's another word and I can't think of it now anyway. In North Dakota they call it something other than a shock. But anyway, you have a shock then of oats or wheat or barley or rye or whatever you're harvesting. And then you take a bundle and you like this, like an X, and you stack it on the top of it so that if it rains, it will shed the water a little bit. And then the shock stands in the field so that the grain can continue to dry until it's time to, hurt, to winnow it or to thresh it. And you come out with your bundle forks, and you pick up the bundles, and you throw them on the grain rack, and you take them to the threshing machine. And I was on probably one of the last legitimate threshing runs in Ringgold County, south of here, where I grew up. I don't know if anybody was still threshing in Adair County at that time or not, but, or Guthrie County, but we still had a group of us that did that. So the threshing machine is where you separate the grain from the stalk and the chaff, and the binder is what cuts it and binds it. And you put those two machines together, and you have a combined machine. <laughs> How many of you knew that's where that name came from? Combine. Yeah, one or two. It's the combination, a combination machine of the binder and the threshing machine. Bringing in the sheaves. Turn to your song sheet and let's sing. And I think maybe now we might kind of know what we're singing about. Let's sing.
I stopped when I was going through Kansas several years ago. The oat harvest had just, or the uh, wheat harvest had finished, and they missed some around the edge. So I went out with my pocket knife and I cut some. So the binder would cut the grain off and put it in bundles so it could dry, but now we need to harvest it. So let's see if we can harvest some of this. Yeah, come over here closer. If we just take one of these and we take our finger and push, there's the seed. There's the kernel of grain in there. And they're really hard. Nope, and it's going everywhere, isn't it? So if we get a whole bunch of these, then we will have some grain in there. And we can make flour with those seeds. That's true. We can make flour out of it, can't we? Should we try doing that? You know what? We need to have that. We need to have something to grind it with, don't we? Because those seeds, if you tried to chew on these, oh, they'd break your teeth. Yeah. They are really, really hard. Now, there's a little bit of chaff in here. See, we're starting to make some flour in the bottom. Mm -hmm. If we took a, quite a bit of time, we'd have a lot of it, wouldn't we? And then we can make what? Yeah. Bread out of it? Pizza dough? Cake? Yeah. We can make donuts. That would be one of my favorite of things to make. Or pie crust out of wheat. We're thankful for this time of year for the harvest of oats. And also, if we go west of here, I think they're probably starting the wheat harvest too. And boy, I've made a mess, haven't I? Yeah. Now, in Jesus' day, and in the Old Testament days, what they would do is go outside. They didn't have threshing machines. They would go outside after they had all this harvested off, and they'd take like a shovel and throw it up in the air, and the wind would blow away all of the chaff and just leave the seed kernel. And then you can put it in the pestle. And they, in fact, where the temple was in Jerusalem was a big flat stone, maybe originally almost as big as this sanctuary. And it was on top of a hill, on top of a, a mountain, but not a very big mountain. And it was a place where people came and threshed their grain because it was there was wind and there was this big flat stone in the middle of what otherwise was a lot of sandy places and dirt and whatever, and you would want to get a dirt mixed in it, right, if you're going to make flour. So people would come for miles around to that threshing floor, and they'd throw the grain up in the air so that the chaff could blow it away. And then eventually um, Abraham bought it, and then that's where they eventually built the temple. And if you go to that spot now, there's a gold dome building, um, a Muslim building, and it's a and inside of it is the remains of that rock, a big flat, big flat rock for threshing bread. Let's give thanks to God, shall we? Let's pray. Thanks, God, for wheat and oats and barley.
God's wonderful people. And we forgot at the beginning, we should wave at our Facebook friends too this morning, shouldn't we? Welcome, glad to have you a part of our gathering as well. We turn this morning to our scripture lesson, reading from the gospel according to Matthew, from chapter 13, beginning at verses 24. And this is traditionally uh, known as the parable of the wheat and the tares. Jesus then told them this story. The kingdom of heaven is like what happened when a farmer scattered good seed in a field. But while everyone was sleeping, an enemy came and scattered weed seeds in the field and then left. Well, tares is what the King James Version used. That's why that's there, instead of weeds. When the plants came up and began to ripen, the farmer's servants could see the weeds. The servants came and asked, sir, didn't you scatter good seed in your field? Where did these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. His servants then asked, do you want us to go out and pull up the weeds? No, he answered. You might also pull up the wheat. Leave the weeds alone until harvest time, and then I'll tell my workers to gather the weeds and tie them up and burn them. But I'll have them store the wheat in my barn. May God's blessings be upon the reading and the hearing of these ancient words that indeed they might bear good fruit in us. When I was in eighth grade, one of the older members of my Tingley Toppers uh, 4-H club told us about a tryout during the announcement time of you know, when we would be naming things that are coming up. One of the older members said that there was going to be a tryout for the county crops judging team. He was a member of the team and he wondered if anyone else would be interested. And several people in the club turned and looked at me. I, I'll pick you up, he said. And I looked at my dad hoping, he was one of our club leaders, I hoping that he would let me get out of it. And he was shaking his head. Yes, okay. So I went to the tryout. Well, some tryout. Four of us showed up and the team was four. So here we are. Intense stuff. The first month we looked at 24 species of crops and 19 species of noxious weeds to learn to identify them by looking at samples of seeds in a muffin tin. So not very many seeds. Is this, oh, is this, oh, is this, oh, is this. And then the second month, we come again and we look at the same 43 species, but this time we're looking at rows of mounted, dried specimens. 
two by three foot chunks of cardboard with the plant. Some of them are not big enough or too big, so you cut them up in three parts and put the, wrap them up in saran wrap. Well, some of them didn't look anything like the weeds that I, or the plants that I saw on our farm, but okay. Then the third month, it's moving down rows of tables that were set up in the room, and we're going to judge pans of grain and rank them in order of marketability. In other words, what would livestock like to eat the most out of these four? So for example, you have four pie pans on a folding table and the bottom of each pan is covered with a half inch corn kernels and you use, by the rules, can't put your finger in it, can't touch it, but you can take your number two pencil eraser end and stir and inspect and examine. And one pan is contaminated with weed seeds. One pan has a few tiny rocks and some fragments of sticks in it. One has a lot of kernels that are cracked and chipped. One pan looks pretty good. And so you rank them, one, two, three, four. And then you write down your reasons, what you found. So you think to yourself, huh, are rocks worse than weed seeds? Are cracked kernels worse than a little turn blue from being moldy at some point in its life seed? Well, that's why we had a coach. And we had a good one. When he was in high school, Melvin Gray from Ringgold County was the highest scoring individual at the state fair his final year of being in competition. Out of 1,500 possible points, Melvin missed, I think, something like eight. And his record still stood when the state fair, Iowa State Fair, quit having this contest with 4-H and FFA members. The only points that Melvin missed, as I recall, were in judging four pans of alfalfa seed. He totally missed the sweet clover seeds mixed in with the alfalfa seeds in one of the pans. Needless to say, he will not have us make this mistake. So at the beginning of every practice, he starts out, alfalfa seeds are shaped like kidney beans. Clover seeds are shaped like a mitten. So here they are. That's alfalfa. That's sweet clover. See the difference? <clears throat> Let's look at both of them. Okay. And remember, these are so small, they would fit uh, not in a capital O in your bulletin. Okay, so you're looking, 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 whoa, whoa, which, which one's which? No big pressure either. I mean, you're just going to represent your whole county at the state fair, and the number one scoring person of all time is looking over your shoulder as you try to decide, is, well, which one is this? Well, at the state fair that year, we did pretty good. Our team got a white ribbon, third place in the whole state. This is kind of fun. I think I'll do it again. But we're going to practice even more. In fact, we did a mock competition with Taylor County next door because their collection of dried weeds and stuff, and, well, they looked a lot different than ours, and we figured, well, that'd be a good thing to have. So the second year, I feel pretty good as I go through the first two sessions. There's this big room that they have all set up. We all go in. We're, we draw numbers. We come in the door. You go to that table, and then the bell rings and you, you've got that time to do this one and then the bell rings and you go to the next table and the bell rings and you go to the next table and then you're done and then you go out and then they clear the room and they bring in then the identification of plants and then you go out and oh, I felt pretty good after the first two sessions. And then the bell rings and the doors open, we go in, I draw my number and I go to my table for judging the four samples. And my number takes me to the table of hay. Oh, I hated judging hay. You get four square blocks of hay. And remember, you can't touch them. You can kind of sm you can smell, you can use your pencil and kind of what? I hated judging hay. 
The bell rang to move to the next table, and I still was befuddled by the four blocks. One sample was obviously moldy. That clearly would be the least desirable. If I were a cow, if I were a cow, I kept saying to myself, because that's the only advice Melvin gave us. He said, judging hay is easy. Just think like a cow. If I were a cow, if I were a cow, where did these samples come from, I thought. North Dakota, I wouldn't eat any of them if I was a cow. Well, there's one of them that smells like it even has sage in it. I don't know, Does, do cows like sage, and so that should be the best? Or maybe it's that they're allergic to it. It should be below even the one that's moldy. I don't know. I'm getting to the next one. I'm still thinking about Hey, I walked to the next one. Oh, man, it threw me off for that whole third part. I look at four pans of soybeans, and I'm still thinking about hay and thinking about, well, maybe I should change the order. And then I'm looking at some pans of wheat, and I'm still thinking about stupid hay. Finally, we turn to our, in our score sheets and give the judges time to tally up the final results. We all gather out, on my t on the team gathers out in the hallway somewhere, all commiserating ourselves, and Melvin finally then comes up for us, and we all say in unison, think like a cow! <laughs> think like a cow! We all hated it. Finally, they call us back in and begin reading off the individual scores. I, the newspaper clipping that I have said that there were 76 participants that year, representing, I think, 50 of the counties or something like that. Well, you know, surely they didn't read all 76, maybe just the top 20, um, which I had made the top 20 in my first year. Felt pretty good about it. Bruce Henderson, who's a new member of our team, come, came in uh, 13th that second year. He's elated. Raymond Shields, who recruited me to the team, is fifth, the highest that of his three years of being in the competition. As the second place guy, with a score of over 1,400 points, goes up to the steed to receive his certificate, I start apologizing to my teammate next to me, saying, I blew it. That stupid hay, I blew it. I didn't even make the top 20. I was, in fact, so upset about it, I didn't even hear when they called my name. My teammates had to push me up to the stage. I still have the blue ribbon somewhere. I couldn't find it this morning. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Where did it go? Did I not get the blue ribbon? Oh, I did not get it on the slide in there. I still have the news clip paper clippings. There it is. There it is. That's Coach Melvin at far left, looking over my right shoulder. Now, that all story of the State Fair is an enjoyable one for me to tell. But it's really just a long backstory for the simple thing that I want to say to you now. When I read scripture, and there's a story that of Jesus referring to seeds from agriculture to deliver a spiritual truth, I take more than just a casual interest in it. Okay? okay? And the parable of the wheat and the tares is based on such an observation. However, I can't say there is a single currently published translation of the Bible that gets it right. They all use the wrong words. Only the Weymouth translation of 1903 correctly identifies as the weed that in the wheat that Jesus is talking about, it identifies it correctly. The old King James Version uses tares, as I mentioned earlier, and most others use the generic term weeds. Well, weeds is better than at least the message around a lot now, it says thistles. Thistles, are you kidding me? Thistle seed doesn't look anything like wheat. Thistle plant doesn't look anything like wheat. Thistle blooms don't look anything like wheat. Verse 26, when the plants grew and the, and the um, seed heads began to form, then the weeds showed up. The point 
of Jesus' story is that the weed looks just like the wheat until the seed head appears. And that is the point of Jesus' story. You see uh, here, I think the best is darnel. And on the left, you have darnel, and on the right, you have wheat. And they look just alike until the seed head appears. Even John Wesley, who lived 300 years ago, recognized the importance of this detail in this passage. In Wesley's commentary on this parable, he points out the misleading use of tares in the King James Bible and offers as the weed's identity that of darnel. Persian darnel, I think, is the best candidate. Persian darnel looks very much like wheat until the seed head appears and then its true identity is known. The imposter is revealed. Darnel has been a pest in the Middle East wheat fields since, well, sounds like from what archaeologists dig up, since the beginning of the harvesting of wheat. It's always been there, mixing itself in. Everyone in Jesus' audience that day would have known exactly what he was talking about and what he was trying to have them see. Do you want us to go out and pull up the darnel when it first came up? And somebody said, oh, I think there's darnel out there. There's weeds. How did that get her? Oh, it must have been an enemy that sowed it, because I certainly bought good seed. What, I said, oh, what should you want us to go out there and pull it up? No. Don't go out and pull it up. You might pull up the wheat. Leave it alone until it's harvest time. Now, we need to be cautious in naming others as weeds. We do it, don't we? I mean, maybe we don't use those exact words, but we treat people, some people, as though they are weeds in us, the pure wheat. When John Wesley gave the general rules to the people called Methodist, his first instruction was to do no harm. In order to show evidence that we are a people who are being saved by God, we should do no harm. And there are times when we need to draw boundaries around behaviors that we will not tolerate and enforce. Well, yeah, things that are destructive of the whole community. Are there times when we must say to someone in a friendship relationship, you know, if you want to continue being my friend, you need to stop doing that. Well, yeah, carefully. Are there times in marriage or in a work environment or on a team when we need to say, stop doing this. Stop. You're destroying the whole, the whole of us. Well, yeah, painfully. But Jesus doesn't have the owner of the field say, it doesn't matter that there's darnel there. It doesn't matter, don't worry about the darnel. Rather, Jesus in his story has the owner of the wheat field say, at the time of harvest, I will tell the workers to collect the darnel first and bind it and burn it and then gather the of harvest, the story goes, at the right time, at the time when knowledge is certain beyond doubt. The second time that I lived um, in Indianola, we showed up at the first time at this church. And a middle-aged couple whom I had known from a parish that I had served while I was a student at Simpson saw us at the back of the church and came running up to us. We had not seen them for more than a decade. The husband came over and immediately grasped my hand in both hands and said, thank you so much for the wise advice you gave me when you were pastor at our church. And I said, Really? 
When our teenage son, he said, ran away from home a second time, I was furious, and I was ready to have him just stay away if he wasn't going to behave better at home. And Art, you said to me, well, you know, someday your son might think about things differently. And a parent, and as a parent, it's important that you have rules and boundaries. Just make sure that you always let him know that the door is open, and whenever he's ready to come home, you can both be better. And then Dad told me how mad he was at me at the time for implying that it was partly his fault and that he should remain open. He was done. And then with tears, he told me about his grandchildren and how his son was now living close by. And he couldn't imagine how empty life would be without his son and his family. We can so easily throw out the good with the proverbial bad. Or as Jesus said to his rural, mostly farmer audience, to pull up the weeds but lose the wheat in the process. God grant us the wisdom to know the right and the patience to wait, to wait, to wait. Let us pray. Loving God, you know how hard life can be at times. How difficult it is for us to be patient with one another. To live together. to be a family, to be a community, to be your people. We thank you for the patience of Jesus, for his coming among us and showing us how you love us, how you are patient with us, how you over and over give us a second chance and a third and a fourth and come as your spirit into our lives to help us with your wisdom to know how to interact with one another so that harvest comes, your love comes, and becomes real among us. Forgive us for times when we have let you down. Guide us in days ahead so that our lives at time of harvest be counted among what you desire, the good grain gathered into the eternal barn, in Jesus' name, amen. We are indeed grateful for the ways that God has been patient with us, for ways that God brings us wisdom on how to live our lives. And one of the ways that we offer our thanks back to God is through the collection of our tithes and offerings.
together now. you go from this place back the rest of your life, go knowing that God, our creator, loves you. That Jesus the Christ is our redeemer and our savior. And God's Holy Spirit has been with us and will be with us always. Amen. Amen.